All right, welcome everyone to the September meeting of the Ottawa Center of the RESC. Thank you for joining us in the auditorium and to those of, uh, to those of you who are on the web. So we have a pretty full uh, meeting today. And uh, I, guess, I guess we should start without uh, further delay. We should start. We've got a lot of interesting talks uh, from, uh, from some of our members. I've got a talk on a very basic uh, aspect of astronomy, which, uh, which I, I has been in the news recently. It's, uh, my talk is more something, you, uh, something in the vein of Al Scott, but uh, it's for beginners. So uh, those of you who are more advanced uh, may find it a little bit uh, a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit uh, boring or repetitive or whatever that or whatever you know. But uh, it's it's good for the for those of us who are just starting out. As I said many months ago, we have a real mix of individuals in the Ottawa Centre, and we need to cater to both those who are seasoned experts and uh, and uh, people who are just starting out. So let's get going. Uh, so oh, so here we have uh, the program. We'll have myself uh, with a few announcements. Dave Chisholm with the Ottawa Skies for September, Al Scott with a 10-minute uh, astronomy news update, Tim Cole with uh, spectroscopy. Uh, then our president will have a smart scope, a smart scope update. We then have the break. Uh, we then have uh, myself speaking about exoplanets. And then we conclude with Bob Olson's talk uh, about his 12, uh, 12 and a half inch newt. Which, if you saw the, the email today, I thought may have been a salamander, but is actually apparently a, uh, a, a telescope. Though apparently the largest, I think the largest salamanders in the world, newts, are actually much larger than 12 and a half inches. But anyway, then we have the observations, the announcements, and the door prizes. Uh, so these are our new members. We have three, is it 10? Two, four, six, yep, uh, nine, sorry, nine new members. Uh, let's give them all a, a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you all very much for joining, uh, and I hope you find the center and the RESC as rewarding as I have. All right, members in the news. We actually have quite a few. This. Uh, is um, from Sky and, Sky and Tell. We have a in memoriam or an obituary uh, from, about Rolf Meyer in Sky and Tell, written by David Levy, and uh, in his memory. And this was published in, I believe, the most recent Sky and Tell, the October the October issue of Sky and Tell. And on the inside of Sky and Tell, I don't know if you remember a couple of months ago. Uh, Rob Dick uh, published an article where he spoke about amber lighting and responsible lighting and uh, dark skies. And uh, it actually generated quite a lot of uh, response and, and, uh, and uh, letters to the editor, or however you want to call it. All that, all that in that circle uh, is, uh, as you can see, it says here, debate, debating red versus amber light. And it just goes on, goes on. And uh, as you can see, Rob uh, responded. Uh, and so it's it generated quite a lot of uh, discussion in the astronomical community. So well done, Rob. Okay. Before we move on to Dave, I just want to make a, um, an, an announcement um, as meeting chair. And that is that it's um, fairly I guess you could say a fairly sad announcement, but um, October will be my last uh, meeting as meeting chair. Next, uh, so next month will be my last meeting as meeting chair. The reason is uh, that I've been appointed a federal prosecutor in Nunavut, so I'll have to be <laughs> moving up there. And unfortunately, the federal government, which n not only cannot, you know, as, as many of you will know, can't even begin to pay its uh, its regular workers. The, uh, the the budget simply doesn't allow for me to come down uh, to Ottawa every month for the uh, for the meetings. So unfortunately, I'll have to be stepping aside, and we'll, we're in the process of looking for, I think, two temporary replacements till the end of the year, and then someone more permanent for the following year. Now, when I originally took on the role of 
meeting chair. I had fully anticipated to be here for the full two years. And it wasn't my intent to leave uh, the role not, I don't want to say unfinished, but uh, before the term had expired. But uh, life has taken a couple of weird turns. And so uh, I've been, as I said, I've been appointed. And so I'll have to, uh, regrettably, because I've enjoyed it, step aside and let someone, uh, someone take over the reins. Well, I mean, I'll have had 10 pretty good meetings and uh, still be able, to be able to come down for the GA. So I'll hopefully still see all of you. And of course, I'll always be able to join the meetings via the internet, if the internet's working. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll be stepping aside. But uh, it, was, uh, it was fun. And uh, I, I look forward to continuing my association with the Ottawa Centre, even from that far north. If I can do it from Australia, 20-something thousand kilometers away, I'm sure I can do it from a cattle just a couple thousand kilometers away. <laughs> All right. Let's offer a round of applause to oh. Roman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you all. All right, we'll move on uh, to our next talk, and that's Dave Chisholm with The Skies for September. Well, uh, there, there's not a, a lot of stuff happening in September in, in okay, terms please, of. Dave. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> all done. However, uh, I, I uh, nothing spectacular happening this month. Okay, thanks, Dave. Okay, <laughs> so moving on, we have a uh, a full moon on September the 16th. Oh, we do have something special. We have the greatest western elongation of Mercury on September the 28th. So obviously you'll see that as the, uh, as the sun is setting, but it's, it's really more visible in the mornings at this point in time. Uh, Venus is uh, not visible at all this month, and Mars is visible in the early evening all month, although it's getting very low in the sky. Uh, Jupiter is not visible at all. Saturn is uh, visible early in the evening all month, but again, it's, it's getting pretty low in the sky. Uranus and Neptune. Uh, are visible all month. And uh, this is a, a new feature I'm going to uh, do for the next little while, which is the Iridium flares. The Iridium communication satellites uh, were launched in uh, late uh, 1990s. It's a constellation of, uh, of satellites. Um, the name Iridium uh, is, is the chemical number is uh, 77. They originally thought they were going to need 77 satellites. Uh, in the end, they only used 66. But the key feature of these is the, uh, the way the solar panels are designed in that they reflect the sun's rays directly onto earth, to the Earth, and it's very bright. So for example, uh, this is actually a particularly good uh, iridium flare. Actually, I'll just go back to the previous slide here. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll sort of see what it looks like. It's a big flash of light. And we're, we're going to experience this on September the 18th at 7.42 in the evening. And it's going to be almost directly overhead. We're two kilometers from the flare center. Some of you out in the country are probably going to be right underneath it. But the, the key thing here is the magnitude is minus eight. Uh, to, to give you a, sort of a, a comparison, uh, Venus is, is around minus four. And uh, minus eight is about 40 times brighter. So it's a very, very bright. OK, so uh, right directly overhead at exactly that time. It only lasts for a few seconds and uh, it'll be quite spectacular. The International Space Station. Um, I, uh, I, as I was pulling my notes together uh, this morning, just going, going through them, I, when I originally put this presentation together a few months ago, I'd forgotten that the meeting was the second Friday. And uh, I looked at my notes this morning and went, uh-oh. I was going to tell you that September the 6th was the best day. Not very helpful. So I've picked another date, September 18th. Uh, I, I should have left that in there and see if anybody noticed. <laughs> and there's your uh, cartoon for the month. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dave. I don't know. Has anyone ever done a talk on the Iridium satellite system? I don't recall because I know nothing about it. But 
would be an interesting talk. Call my girl. Oh yeah? Does he does he work? I know he was doing satellite tracking. Is he still? Is that his thing? He knows all that stuff. Oh, okay. All right, uh, Al uh, Al Scott with a ten minute astronomy news update. Greetings. So news for September. Here's a, a throwback to one that I uh, talked about a little bit earlier while, while the Rosetta mission was going on. The Philae lander was a uh, part of the Rosetta mission and it landed on the comet uh, 67P churyumov gerasimenko and bounced a few times and then got stuck in a crevice and no one was really sure where it ended up. Well, after not knowing where it's been for almost two years while the comet went through its, uh, its perihelion, uh, became active, the, the orbiter had to back away to get out of the dust, they couldn't find it. Now it's nearing the end of the mission, uh, it's, it's closed into about 1.7 miles orbit now, and it's taken some really high resolution images and it found the, the lander, and you can see it here, there's the lander in a crack on its side. Uh, so we finally located it, kind of a neat uh, way to tie off the end of the mission. On September 30th, the actual Rosetta spacecraft is scheduled to also uh, crash land on the comet so, uh, and complete its mission. So interesting. <clears throat> In other news, you can see that, okay. <clears throat> Dragonfly 44 an ultra-diffuse galaxy located 300 million light-years away in the constellation Coma weighs about the same as our Milky Way galaxy, except it's 99.99% dark matter and has less than a hundredth the number of stars as the Milky Way. Because of its extremely low surface brightness, galaxies of this type have never, seen befo never been seen before. It was discovered a year ago using the Dragonfly telephot telephoto array pictured here uh, and one of the team members, one of the leading team members on this is uh, Canadian astronomer Roberto Abraham. Um, to determine the amount of dark matter in this galaxy, they used the Keck uh, 2 Deimos instrument, uh, which measures the velocity of stars looking at their redshift. And it took 33 and a half hours of integration over a period of six nights. And that's how they determine the galaxy's mass. Basically, they see how fast the stars are moving and use Newton's laws and they know how much mass you need to have for the stars to stay in their orbits with those velocities. So they were very surprised uh, to realize that this is, the mass of this is the same as the Milky Way, although it's 100 times less bright uh, at this distance. And the, we're looking for a lot more uh, discoveries like this. this. This dragonfly eye array here opens up a whole new realm of, of observations. It's an innovative multi-lens array uh, designed for ultra-low surface brightness astronomy at visible wavelengths. It was commissioned in 2013 with only three lenses and is growing in size. It's aimed at looking at extremely faint complex structures from, um, you know, looking at uh, galaxy um, trails where galaxies have collided and you may have uh, trails of stars around galaxies. You can't, you can't really see them, uh, but you may be able to see them with this. You can't see them with other instruments because of the the background sky glow and the, the relative brightness of these objects is very dim, these large distended objects. It is designed to reduce scattering and internal reflections in its optics. It actually does this using commercially available Canon 400 millimeter lenses. These lenses have nanofabricated surface coatings which basically provide perfect anti-reflection coatings throughout the visible range. And you can buy them yourself if you'd like. So it's a relatively inexpensive uh, telescope. Also, because it's imaging the galaxy through multiple lenses simultaneously, akin to a dragonfly's compound eye, it enables further removal of unwanted light and reflections uh, through post-processing. Um, so the, the array is actually home, its home is in New Mexico Skies hosting facilities. And images show, have shown that the dragonfly is at least 10 times more efficient than its nearest rival in detecting these very dim objects. But it's a very interesting object. Nobody, knows, nobody has seen these before, and nobody really knows how they form. My final item, uh, Proxima Centauri. There's been a planet detected around the nearest star to our sun. 
uh, called Proxima Centauri B. This is an artist's impression of what it might look like. And scientists believe that this planet appears to be in the what was called the Goldilocks zone, or the habitable zone where liquid water can exist on its surface. It's about 1.3 times the size of Earth and is expected to be a rocky planet. Uh, the planet is super close to, the, to Proxima Centauri, and that's because it's a, a dim red dwarf star about one-eighth the size of our sun. So its habitable zone is much closer to its, uh, its primary than the Earth to the sun distance. Its orbit, the planet orbits in a mere 11.2 days, about an eighth the length of Mercury's orbit. So it's very close. Uh, and because of this closeness, it's likely tidally locked so that one surface faces the star all the time and the other surface of the planet is continually in darkness. Um, so it may not be the best place to live. It may be very hot on one side and very cold on the other side. Also Proxima Centauri as a, as a red dwarf star has various processes going on which, which make, give it a strong magnetic field. The, these dimmer stars have convection cells in them that, which twist the magnetic field and they have huge super flares of radiation that would probably bathe this planet. The amount of X-ray radiation coming off this star is very similar to the amount coming off our sun, yet this planet is much closer. So you wouldn't want to stand on the surface of this planet even if it was warm and, and because of the radiation. Uh, however, perhaps there could be life in oceans uh, existing along the, the terminus, the terminator perhaps. No one's really sure. And there's a lot of interest in, in actually sending probes out to this. And you may have heard in the news, Stephen Hawking and some billionaires are getting together to try and think about how to send uh, small 10 gram solar sail probes out to this star in 20 years time and come back, well, not come back, but to send information back. But a very interesting and nearby discovery. Uh, so that's the news for now. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Uh, just in relation to the, oh, just before you come up, Tim, just one second. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, just with regards to, to this dragonfly lens, it's interesting, I think it's fascinating. I mean, you know, it's, it, all the information is out there. You just have to know how to look. Um, and with regards to, to, the, to the lander, um, is, is there anything that's, is it salvageable, salvageable in the sense, can we do anything with it or is it toast? No, it's toast. toast. Okay, so, we, so we, we know exactly where it is, but we can't do anything with it. Yeah. Good. We can send some data and we can look at the data. Good. Now we know where it came from. Okay, we can chalk, one, chalk, chalk that one up as a W. Good. All right. Uh, all right. Our next talk will be Tim. Are you uh, sure? <laughs> yeah. That's what it says up here. Uh, spectroscopy for outreach. Thanks. Take it away, Tim. I'm allowed to do that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Oh. Just so long as, you know, the meeting chair agrees. Um, Considering the new powers, I really don't want to take them off. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, as long as I'm not in Nunavut, I guess I'm okay. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> all right, that really stank even by my standards. Anyhow, um, spectroscopy, I think, is probably, well, if you had to pick um, one scientific tool that has given us more about the nature of the universe, and that goes for even more than astronomy. I, I would have to vote spectroscopy. Um, it's also one of those ones that I've always found tricky to do outreach with, um, for all kinds of reasons. Now, I'm just gonna give you a super brief spectroscopy 101 here. Um, I know most of us know this, but you know it's always nice to get a bit of a review. Um, as you may recall, we have two basic flavors of uh, spectrum. We've got an emission spectrum and an absorption spectrum. The emission spectrum comes from very thin, hot gas that's emitting specific wavelengths of light. The absorption spectrum comes when you've got a somewhat thicker mass, it doesn't necessarily have to be super thick, but a mass of gas in front of an object that's pretending to be a black body since nothing's a real black body, but comes fairly close. So what's happening is that is gapping out certain wavelengths depending on the material. Now, a guy named Kirchhoff came up with some interesting stuff, which basically demonstrated that the emission lines and the absorption lines have a one-for-one -one match. So an element that produces that pattern of lines up here for the emission spectrum would also 
produce the same lines for an absorption spectrum. So this gives us fingerprints. This particular table here is really quite cool. It's the periodic table of the elements with spectra. And uh, you can really see how complicated these things get. Take a look here at molybdenum. And this is a fiercely complex uh, spectrum. Um, there are a few where we just don't have any. Um, astatine, for example. Uh, I don't know if we've even got milligram quantities of that stuff. Um, francium pretty much the same way, but you can never get France to cooperate on anything. Um, yeah. Um, we have uh, a spectrum for plutonium. Interestingly enough, not for Neptunium. I'm rather really surprised at that. I'd really like to see the spectrum of this. Uh, because there's some really weird stuff that happens around these two elements. Um, anyway, we won't get into that. So this is a kind of a, you know, the rogue gallery. I mean, this is uh, basically the, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the database for, uh, for elements. And there's also uh, spectral uh, signatures for, uh, for molecules, but they're even more fiercely complex than this sort of stuff. Just as a bit more of the background, up at the top is pretty much what most people have in mind for a spectrum, the pretty one, um, which is really nice to look at, but it's not that good to analyze. So for most of the time, you're looking at this rather sciencey looking graph. It must be sciencey, it's a graph. It doesn't make any sense. It's got to be science. Um, plotted with intensity versus wavelength. I brought you here the uh, emission spectrum of a complex fl compact fluorescent lamp. I'm going to have trouble with that all evening, I can see. A compact fluorescent lamp done with actually a very cheap uh, spectroscope, as it turns out. And here's the problem I find with doing outreach with spectroscopy. You have a few choices for stuff for amateur astronomers. You've got something like a, a litro spectrometer. Uh, you can buy them from a, a few places, one of them being an outfit called Sheliac, which will sell you a nice Littrow spectroscopy uh, spectrometer for about 1,300 euros. You then have to build it. Um, or you can get an eyepiece grating that you can thread into your eyepiece and, and look at cool stuff. I've got one of these, not this particular brand, uh, but I've got one. I mean, it's nice, but for outreach, I find it leaves a little bit, because you're looking through a telescope, and it's hard enough to know when somebody's seeing a star you know, you, you get particularly little kids, you know, they look at it and, and, you know, they put the eyepiece here and say, yeah, I see the moon. Well, kid, it's not in your eye and we're looking at Saturn. Um, so, you know, and then when you're doing with something that is, oh, look at this helium, look at this hydrogen absorption line in, in Arcturus and it's, what am I looking at? And, and there's no way you can tell. So these I find, well, this, um, oh boy, I'd have to make room in my scope shed if I bought one of these things because I'd be sleeping with it. Um, and one of these, I just, I, I've had very limited success doing outreach with this little one. It's nice, it's fun, but it's, it's limited. Now, you can get your typical student spectrometers, and this one's kind of nice. It's a nice, simple little thing. It's uh, much smaller than it would look. It's actually maybe the size of uh, you know a couple fingers. You can slip it in a pocket if you don't mind flattening the paper. Um, and it works with a small chunk of uh, CD, CD-ROM, for a, a diffraction and reflection grading. Um, it's actually not a bad little thing. These are absolutely horrible. Um, I think their best use is for um, personal weights for very lazy people. Um, I've used them a few times. Yep, that takes care of me. Um, now, you, never mind, forget it. Um, they're, they're shabby, they're very poorly made. Uh, you get a terrible, uh, terrible results out of them. And for what they are, they're absurdly expensive. Sorry, Boreal Science Kit, but that's reality. Um, so these leave a bit to be desired. So, well, I was trying to figure out what to do with a course I've been putting together lately. Um, I realized how much of a dinosaur I am because I forgot about, you know, sort of more modern approaches. And I stumbled into a little outfit called Public Lab, and they sell, among other things, kits and plans for a simple little spectroscope that works with a, uh, a super dirt cheap webcam, which as a webcam absolutely stinks. But for this, it's not bad. Um, you might be able to tell from this, this is put on a small piece of board covered with um, 
Velcro, oops, I'm sorry, hook and loop fastener. Can't, just that copyright thing uh, and trademark thing. And uh, a diffraction grating made out of a DVD, which I'll show you a little bit later. You just ruined the webcast. Yeah, I know, there we go. P product placement. Uh, there's a close up. You can see our little DVD piece and uh, our little DVD piece there. And this actually is a pretty decent little system. And uh, if, if you feel like building it yourself, you can get the plans, or if you wanted to uh, shell out, I forget what it is for this. I think it's, I don't know, it's, it's a few dollars. It's not terribly expensive. Or you can get the even simpler version. And this is where my dinosaur is showing. Uh, this little beast uh, showing its photograph of a, comp of a comp compact fluorescent light. Oh, man, I have trouble with that, as I said. Um, and what this thing uses, dinosaur, is a smartphone, like everything else nowadays. Um, and I totally forgot about this. And it, it actually works remarkably well. There's a the little kit. Now, again, you can print it yourself. I am lazy and have all the, uh, the digital acuity of a, uh, well, I don't know, something that has very little digital acuity. Um, and I think the slit's a little too big, but otherwise it's a pretty nice little thing. You can just print it out and make your own, not a biggie. So here's the spectrophone. And yeah, I know I've seen microscopes and stuff, but this for me was something of a, oh, why didn't I think of this? Well, I thought of it anyway. Um, now, you can also, the other thing that you always have is you want to show people lines from the sun, and it's one of those things you always have to be a little careful about because you don't want people looking at the sun themselves. So the solution is take a pin, put it in a piece of folded cardboard, and look at with a diffraction grating. Just simple diffraction glasses. And there you've got Joseph Fraunhofer's lines. And here it is, annotated. The streaks here are apparently from scratches on the needle. And the vertical lines are the Fraunhofer lines. And this must cost all of about a uh, dollar, maybe. Now, making the diffraction grading from the DVD, um, it turns out there's a little twist in there that I hadn't thought about. Basically, you can, it, it's pretty obvious how you can turn a, a CD into a reflection grading, but I never thought of turning it into a transmission grading. And uh, I still am not terribly certain about the pros and cons of them, but I do know the reflection gratings I've fiddled with are really, really nuisances to fiddle with. It's hard to get them lined up, and it's hard to, to get uh, you know the people you're trying to do outreach with to actually see something clearly. So you can see up here we actually get a pretty respectable, um, a pretty respectable diffraction grating out of a DVD, 1,350 lines per millimeter. Um, and not quite as good with a CD, but you know it's still respectable. You can still do some interesting stuff with it. Now, what I've got here is a really awful video um, done with an ancient uh, GoPro strapped to my head, um, which shows a really flattering view of my equatorial bulge, but um, and not the best of views of the process, but it'll give you an idea. So here we go. Um, I love that, Chris. What have you done with it? All right, play. No, wrong one. That's not a diffraction grating. <laughs> it, it never fails. You can try this stuff out any number of times, and it just will not cooperate with you when it comes to the crunch. Um, yes. This is the time when I resort to my stalling tactics. Um, does anyone know how you can assess what science you're dealing with? No? If, it's, uh, if it wiggles, it's biology. If it stinks, it's chemistry. And if it doesn't work, it's physics. <laughs> um, or computer science, one or the other. We haven't yet figured out which. Tim, I have a question. Yes. Uh, do spectral lines identify different isotopes of elements, or is it no. purely chemical? Purely chemical. Purely chemical. Uh, all, what you're getting from the spectral lines is um, the effects of the, speak up Tim, it's the effects of the electrons changing state. So um, yeah. you're not going to get any effect whatsoever with isotopes. I just thought it would be good to clear that up. Yeah. Um, 
It's possible you might be able to get some really oddball effects, but uh, I've not read of any success with it. Uh, there are a few things that make a difference with, uh, with isotopic resonances, but uh, I, I don't think it would work for spectroscopy. Oh, here we go. So the trick with the DVD is there's actually two layers to them that actually come apart fairly easily. Um, you do want a pair of gloves for this because um, skin oils will absolutely ruin the uh, diffraction grating that you produce out of this. And there we have it. There's the reflective bit in the side, which is good for making a little respective reflective scopes, and you can see the transmission grating on the side. Now, you'll see it in a moment after I do the first bathing of it. Um, there's a purple dye on them. And uh, that purple dye is actually what gets reacted by the, uh, by the lasers when they're, when they're forming. And we don't want that purple dye. So it comes off quite nicely with, um, with rubbing alcohol. Um, now, I did this in a little tiny tray so I could get a photo of it. The first time I did it, I did it in the bathroom sink. Um, and that's another reason why I did it in a tray, because, um, well, there was some special disagreement about using it in the bathroom sink. But um, I'm not, well, no, wasn't purple very long. <laughs> So uh, by the time you're finished, you have a pretty reasonable little diffraction grating. And you can now cut this into pieces, which turns out actually to be the toughest thing with it, is to get it cut so that you have um, the, diffraction, the, the, the lines uh, at a nice right angle to the cut line. That turns out to be one of the trickier things. Maybe it's easy if you actually have you know, technical ability. But for me, it's monstrously complicated. Um, so this gives you a pretty good way, and you can make you know, quite a few uh, diffraction gratings out of this. And it works remarkably well. This, though, is why you've got the curves in the, um, in the, in the refraction, uh, in the diffraction, uh, back up, Jim, just back up. Don't even try to fix this. This is why you get the curves in the um, speak. The emission spectrum for the compact fluorescent light is you're getting a bit of the effect from the curved, uh, from the curved shape of the diffraction grating. So, these provide some really, really inexpensive ways to come up with some pretty useful little toys for demonstrating what I think is probably one of the most fundamental um, things we've got in science, which is spectroscopy. And this gives a great way to introduce it to people at a fairly reasonable cost. Um, and it's something that you can actually get kids to do by themselves. Well, with supervision, of course. But you know, you can make it yourself. You can do it yourself. You can fiddle with it yourself. Uh, and that's always a big thing for outreach. So that's basically it in a nutshell. I'll be using this for uh, an astronomy course that I'm in the process of teaching now. So we'll see how this works with real students. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how that goes, but I, susp I, I really have high hopes for this. So there you go, folks. That's uh, the quick rundown on the quick and dirty at least I hope it's quick and dirty, it's certainly dirty, um, methods for some outreach for spectroscopy that I really think is going to help really get across a, a pretty fundamental piece of, of how we know what we know about the universe. Okay, folks, thank you much. Yep. Yeah. Will you take one or two questions? Yeah, sure, if we got time. Do you have any questions? Oh, uh, up at the back, yeah. Um, you, noticed the, you noticed the difference between the CDs versus DVDs. Did you notice any difference between dual layer and single layer DVDs, or? Uh, the I tried doing a dual layer, yeah. and I couldn't get a decent diffraction grading out of it. It may be something in the construction. I needed the single layer DVD minus R. Uh, maybe you can make a double layer work. I couldn't, but I'm also clueless, you know, so your mileage may vary. Um, yeah. Did I try what? Blu-ray. No, I didn't try Blu-ray. Um, and I've not read any indication that you can do the same trick. It doesn't appear to be double layered, you know, with a layer that you can split easily like that. Okay. Uh, it, I, it could be. I don't know. So does this show the, the lines much more clearly than your, your small eyepiece? Oh, yeah, definitely. It does show the lines much more clearly than the eyepiece. But it works better, for, I find, for, um, uh, for emission. So if you want to use something with, um, for example, salt, sprinkling salt in a candle, I'm surprised, gives you a remarkably decent sodium line. I mean, normally you'd expect to have metal salts on a wire, but it, it, sprinkling salt in the candle flame actually works better than you'd imagine. It doesn't last long, but it's there.
Anybody? Okay. And now, moving along, it's time for the annual dinner tickets. So we are having, this year's annual dinner is a rerun of last year's annual dinner. Um, same place, same menu, same price. And I'm asking for all the door prizes back again so I can give them out again. <laughs> no? No takers? Okay. Well, it was worth a try. That's the thing I hate most about the annual dinner is going out and knocking on doors and saying, please, sir, may I have a door prize? I feel like Oliver Twist going up to Fagan. Anyway, um, our speaker this year is Dr. Gordon Osinski. Uh, I'm told that uh, West University of Western Ontario is now Western University. I will avoid any of the obvious jokes about hats and spurs. Uh, but here's Gordon Osinski. He goes under, among one of his uh, URLs, is spacerocks.ca. Um, I have not yet discovered what he's talking on. Um, in fact, I, I, he's promised me he's coming, even though his email has an automatic line that says, I'm on uh, sabbatical right now. So um, I may be coming back looking for somebody to do a talk. No, he's actually promised me he will be here. And I believe him because he looks honest. And yeah, that's right. So um, yeah, it's right. Name's Gordon. He's got to be good. He has not yet told me about what his talk is, other than it will be some planetary geology related thing that I guess you know Simon can look at and <laughs> assess or what have you. So anyway, same effect. Um, you can pick up your tickets from me, or. You can uh, send me in a note. You can do the email, um, the electronic transfer if you want. Uh, this year, we have actually brought in a uh, credit card processing system for the center. It's one of those little square gadgets. Um, our treasurer knows how to use it. I haven't got a clue because um, you cannot put the square on one of these. Um, there is no app for that. Um, and I can't do, well actually you can because there's a little camera in this, but it, it, it really stinks. Um, it doesn't, anyway, never mind. So anyway, folks, should be a good dinner again this year. Um, haven't got anything else, so thank you all. Buy tickets. Awesome. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add that there are tickets when is it? here. When is it? When is it? Back up. November the 18th, I think? Yeah, November the 18th. Oh, sorry, it's, I got it. It's the same Friday as last year, except earlier. <laughs> November, November 18th, it was right, 18th. On, right on the slide. Right yeah. on the slide. And, um, and it's on the tickets. There are, there are tickets available here today as well. Shortly. Uh, short, shortly? Okay. At the break, at the same place as the calendars. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, our, our ticket production specialist is running quite a little late. Oh, oh, there she is. I don't know, Tim. Maybe not. It's not fraud. Uh, it's, not, it's not fraud. Yeah. So it's true, it's not fraud. Uh, all right. So moving on. Uh, if we could, uh, Brian? Yeah. If you want to come down and, uh, or is it, or is this uh, Gordon? Are you giving us the, the GA update? Oh, yeah. Both of you come on down and serve it amongst yourselves. Yeah. Circle of Death. Yes, arm wrestling. Beard a thon. I'm not doing the Beard a thon. Yeah. And in this corner. So that's okay. That's okay, Tim. It's, it's the joke's been done. It's good. <laughs> Keep them under control. Yeah. That's it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Take, take it away. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Roman. Hi, everybody. Uh, quick update on the uh, General Assembly. So things are going along really well. We've got a lot of things, uh, a lot of things in really good shape, uh, including we have, uh, I would say, 95% of our schedule. Is, uh, is pretty much salted down right now. It's a couple of details that Tim and I have to figure out, a couple of things we're sorting out with the accommodation. Uh, one thing I want to give you an alert on right now is that because of uh, the uh, extraordinary activity for next year, it being Canada's 150th uh, birthday, they're trying to get the rooms committed as soon as possible. 
So what's going to happen is that we're going to have, we just had this confirmed uh, this evening, or uh, this morning actually, that we're going to have to have people confirm their bookings uh, for, it's mostly for out-of-towners, confirm their bookings at the residence uh, by uh, December 9th. Right, that gives us time to get it in uh, in good time. So it's uh, quite a bit earlier than uh, than we were than we were originally expecting, uh, but uh, I think we can manage with this. the uh, The whole setup is looking really good. The catering is going to look fantastic. So the same catering that we're going to have for the bank for the uh, for our um, our annual dinner is going to be doing our catering or our banquet, the uh, the Ruth Northcott lecture reception, and some of the other uh, meals right on campus there. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the uh, General Assembly? We're going to be l still looking for more volunteers, but uh, we've had a lot of front-end things to, to get in order, and uh, so we've got most of that in place, so we're going to start putting the, some of the committees together in terms of uh, who will be manning the, uh, the registration desk, who will be manning the, uh, uh, the transportation desk, that type of thing. So a number of things to come together. Uh, the one main thing we really would like some help on uh, is our um, uh, fundraising. All right, if, if anybody has any experience in uh, professional fundraising or higher level fundraising, we could certainly use some ideas. So please feel free to uh, uh, you can contact uh, Chris Tarrant through the, uh, through the center and uh, we'll get our, our information up on the website shortly. Uh, a, a lot of our most recent activity on the GA has been focusing on the website. So uh, sorting out uh, the uh, Ottawa Centre uh, website, making sure we've got a, a stable platform now to, to be working from, but we're also gonna be working from the national uh, the national website as well. So they've got uh, a general assembly page there that we can just now, they'll, we'll strip out some of the old information and we'll populate it with the uh, information for the 2017 GA in Ottawa here. So we're looking at a really, really good program for next year and I'm hoping that we're going to get lots of people coming out for the, uh, for the activities. Um, uh, we're looking at organizing a star party. Uh, we're right now one of the tentative tours we're getting is for the Defen Bunker. So now what we're looking at doing is uh, is have the our star party, which we we're originally going to have uh, at the on the campus at uh, Algonquin. We'll have it out at uh, um, uh, at the uh, Defen Bunker. So we can so we'll have a barbecue on the Friday evening at. Uh, at the campus, then we'll uh, we'll bus out to the Defen Bunker, and uh, as people are being taken through on tours of the Defen Bunker, we can have the Star Party getting underway at the same time. So that's that'll be one of the fun things. Uh, the and you'll see we'll have put the information up again on our speakers. Uh, we've got uh, one of the uh, key astronomers from uh, uh, Canada France Hawaii Telescope, Nadine Manset, is a uh, Quebecer. Uh, coming out to uh, to talk to us, she'll be our banquet speaker, and I think this is going to be a, a really good presentation. Uh, and we also have Eric Steinbring from uh, uh, from the Dominion. Uh, is, sorry, is it from the National Research Council out on the West Coast uh, coming in? And he's done some work with telescopes, small telescopes in the Arctic. And my daughter, when she was running an observatory up on the top of Baffin Island, there she ran into uh, Dr. Steinbring while he was doing all these little experiments. And uh, so I think we're going to get a nice a nice range of uh, of subject matter in his uh, in his presentation. He'll be the Ruth Northcott lecturer. And we have, um, uh, of course, our, our uh, keynote speaker is going to be uh, Ken Hewitt White, who was a member here back in the 60s. And the, I know we have some people, uh, John and Rob, other people who, uh, who hobnobbed with Ken back in the day. Of course, Ken is one of the uh, columnists for Sky News magazine. And uh, just the guy's, the guy's hilarious. And he's, uh, you could ask for better than him. Uh, being a, a RASC member, he's got long RASC history to be hobnobbing with us. Uh, through our General Assembly weekend. And the, one of the, I think one of the most special things that we're offering at this uh, General Assembly is that 95% uh, of the uh, key speakers, apart from our three uh, main speakers that way, are coming right from the seats right here. We're using our own members. So a lot of times in the other GAs, they'll bring in a lot of other uh, speakers from uh, from various uh, places, but I think uh, one of the things I knew right out of the gate was uh, I think it was, it was time we showed off uh, the talent of the Ottawa Centre, so I think we can do that really, really nicely. All right, there's our uh, our logo. Uh, that's we'll get that stamped up on some uh, on some T-shirts. I had showed one off there a couple of months ago. All right, but it's uh, it's coming together. It's coming together, and uh, you know time is marching on. And you know I remember when it was oh we still have 15 months to go. Well now here we are, and it's uh, we're we're starting June 29th, right? It'll be a, a Thursday, uh, starting with people registering uh, late in the afternoon of the 29th of June next year. 
and uh, ready to go uh, bright and early. Uh, well, not too bright and early. I'm, uh, I'm not a morning guy. Uh, on the Friday and Saturday and Sunday. So we've got uh, full days of, uh, of activity. We've also uh, Tim and I have scheduled in some uh, some uh, a few we call them pause periods, just so if you need time, just to go out and uh, uh, shake it all off and get a stretch and, and go back into presentations, or if you need to, you want to run back to the res for whatever reason, or it's uh, we've got uh, we're not trying to put too too much in, and I think this is one of the things you can find with any uh, any convention is that uh, if they try to pack in too much, it starts to detract from it. So uh, you know we had some good experience with. Uh, with the way some of the things were programmed in uh, in London uh, in May, they they put an amazing program together in a very short period of time. So, so we're hoping that with the the lead time we have, we can do something really well. Uh, is there anybody here as a knows right now that they're planning to attend the uh, come out to the GA? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be good, and I think there'll be some uh, some interesting things. We'll be publishing the schedule. We'll be getting the information up on the websites uh, very shortly now. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, I'm one of the National Council reps. Uh, Robert Dick up in the back is the, your other National Council representative. So if you have any questions concerning uh, your relationship with the RASC on the national level or what's national doing, uh, you can talk to Rob or, Rob or talk to me. I've been pretty much focused on the, on the GA work, the General Assembly work, but uh, I can just, uh, just to give you a little quick update on the national side of things, the, uh, the, na the board, the board of directors is going off on retreat very shortly and one of the things they're working on is uh, looking at the uh, revitalization, basically, of the RESC. So they're asking questions, and they put together a small working group that came out of an exercise at the London General Assembly. So I've been involved with, uh, with about 10 other people in, uh, in prioritizing what we think might be uh, key activities so that we can say, well, how do we make the RESC more responsive uh, to the members? How do we make it more responsive to the general public? How do we make it more responsive to a centre? Right? So we're looking at different uh, things that national can provide, things that the centers can provide to one another and to national. So it's a, I think there's a lot of good things in the wind. And, uh, and if, you, if you have any way that, if you're thinking that you could uh, participate or uh, offer suggestions, I mean, you can always, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to contact us and, and, uh, and offer suggestions for how to improve, uh, improve things here. All right, any questions at all on any of that? Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I highly encourage everyone to go to this uh, to the RESC, considering that it's in Ottawa, so it's not like you have to travel very far. Um, but it should be a. But the program that's uh, that's being proposed, uh, it does look very very exciting, it'll be a very productive and interesting GA. Uh, so uh, now, just before, just before we go to the break, just mention that um, the Starby Q, which was supposed to be uh, tomorrow, has been postponed to the rain date of the 24th. This is, although the daytime is supposed to be quite nice, uh, there's, there's a strong chance of showers and thunderstorms as the evening rolls in. So a decision has been made to uh, to move the move the date, and so uh, contact. Uh, where's the contact information again? Oh. Well, uh, it's I think it's it's Peter Peter Martha. Farkas. Martha. 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 Sorry, Martha Farkas is the contact. So um, I'm sure she, if you need any further information, get in touch with her, and uh, she can uh, fill you in. Uh, calendars have arrived again earlier than uh, most years, but uh, we have them available. Uh, Sixteen dollars for one, thirty dollars for two. We have um, a former member who has uh, one of her images as, uh, as as one of the months. Deborah Cervolo, who currently lives in British Columbia, is it Kelowna or that area, Okanagan? Soyuz. Oh, oh Soyuz. Okay. So, no, so, uh, hers is April. So this uh, particular, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Sorry? One, one to the left. It's gone now. Oh, sorry. Oh, so, well, uh, oh it's, it's, a, it's a moving thing, I see. I'll have to wait till it comes back. Um, Watchbot never boils. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So, uh, Deborah Saravolo, she provided one of the images. Uh, and uh, so, a former Ottawa member has an image uh, on the calendar. Again, 
we have uh, tickets uh, available. You can either pay cash or you can pay using the uh, Square app, which accepts credit cards. Uh, there is an additional surcharge of $1.25. Uh, and uh, you heard uh, uh, Tim speak about the, uh, the, uh, the dinner, the annual dinner. All right, uh, I forgot to put these up. These are some of the, I had a few people approach me and ask, uh, ask about membership. Um, these are some of the membership uh, benefits. And I'll mention later how much membership costs and uh, in, in, a, in a future slide, but these are just some of the benefits you get if you're a member of the Ottawa Center. All right, uh, our President Gordon, if you could come and give us a smart school pop, uh, update. Good evening. So over the past five years, uh, Jim Maxwell has been our director of the uh, SmartScope project at Shirley's Bay. And over that time, uh, he's gradually managed to get most of the systems up and running. And with the help of his team, he was even able to uh, broadcast the transit of Mercury. At the last council meeting, uh, he had some really impressive deep sky images that they'd taken with the system. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jim resigned as director of the Smart Scope. So for everything that Jim's done over the past five years, I think we, he deserves a round of applause. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim, for everything you did. We really appreciate it. Um, so earlier this week, a council met uh, to discuss where we go from here with the Smart Scope. Uh, this is a project that, as many of you know, has dragged on, dragged on for almost 17 years. Uh, despite the efforts of Jim and his team, there's still a couple of major hurdles to overcome before the project can fulfill its mandate, uh, that being to be remotely operated and accessible from home by computer. Uh, we're not, but we're not prepared to let it drag on much longer. We are going to bring this to a resolution very shortly, one way or another. Um, so how many people out there, can we have the lights up for just a sec? How many out there uh, think they would use the smart scope if it was available tomorrow? Oh, so there is some, some good interest. That's good, thank you. Uh, Paul Klinginger has uh, stepped forward uh, to, to assess our current position and he's going to determine if there's any way to get this up and running. Um, he's got, and if there is, he's going to work on developing an operational model. A large part of making that model work is going to be having a, a number of uh, highly dedicated volunteers. Uh, Paul will be making a presentation next month uh, where he's going to outline where we currently stand, what needs to be done, uh, how he sees us getting there, and what the duties of the volunteers will be. If you uh, think this is something that would interest you, then please contact me or Paul and we'll have uh, more information for you next month. This thing will not work without some volunteers. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, Gordon, there was a question up here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry, first meeting. Could you just give cold notes what the Smart Scope project is? There you go. Yeah, there we go. Ah, <laughs> uh, Smart Scope predates me. <laughs> um, SmartScope was a, a millennium project to have a remotely accessible uh, telescope. So you can log in. The theory is uh, that you as a user could log in and uh, do astral imaging with the SmartScope. It's a 16-inch mead on a Paramount ME mount and it's, it's in an observatory out at Shirley's Bay. And is this a national project or just a nope. Ottawa Center? No, it's Ottawa Center. Ottawa Center. We've, it's, it's never full, been fully operational. We came close a couple of times and then we didn't have the volunteers to, to, to work it. And then um, about five years ago, Jim took over and he's put a lot of work into it. Um, got rid of all the bugs and we replaced a couple of boards and uh, we replaced motors or repaired motors on the, the dome, different things like that. And, and now everything, all of those systems are, are working quite well. So 
we, we still have some uh, internet, internet issues and we have um, the, the remote control aspect to resolve yet. Does that do it? No. Any other questions? No? Okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Jim, and uh, thank you uh, to, uh, and thank you, Paul, for taking over. All right, moving on. Um, it'll be, this'll, this'll be my talk on exoplanets. With the recent uh, interest uh, following the discovery of Proxima Centauri B, or short form Proxima B, that is a, uh, that it appears to be a Earth-like planet, something like it. There's been a lot of talk in the media and generally about exoplanets, and there's been a renewed interest in exoplanets. Interestingly enough, though the search has been going on for a few decades now, exoplanets haven't really generated much interest outside the astronomical, astronomical community. I guess people were waiting to hear some of the big news, which is we found something like Earth. It's taken a while, but we finally, but it looks like we may finally be getting close to, uh, to making, uh, to fi finding another planet similar to ours. Sorry. Sorry, I just got my notes on my iPad. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction into exoplanets. This is, um, this is for beginners. So uh, I'm not an expert, uh, and I know that a lot of you out there aren't experts. We have a lot of beginners in this, uh, in our center. And so for those who might not know what exoplanets are and, uh, and have kind of no, um, have very little knowledge of the search that's gone on, this talk is for you. For those of you who are seasoned experts, you're more than welcome to, uh, to listen in and refresh your memories or you know, catch some more Pokemon if you need to. So the, um, the, the search for exoplanets has always been a bit of a side project in uh, astronomy. The, we've, all, we've often heard about the search, uh, you know, deep radio uh, uh, observing. We have deep sky observing. We have the Hubble Space Telescope. This was, I guess you could almost call it macro astronomy. The search for exoplanets has always been, as I said, a bit of a side project, something that's done by a, a select group of people, a, a, almost a core group, of, uh, core group of people, and this has been for a variety of reasons. First of all, exoplanets are difficult to detect. They're small relative to their star. Uh, they will almost always be smaller than, than their star in terms of size. They're dark in that they, they don't produce their own light. Uh, their orbits are uncertain, and for a while it was beyond our ability, our technical ability, to, to detect exoplanets. However, with the renewed interest that has accompanied the discovery of Proxima b, we may see a surge of interest in, in search and discovery of exoplanets, particularly now that we think uh, we may have found something very similar to the Earth. And really, looking for planets similar to ours is really a way of finding our own place in the universe. Are we unique in the sense of, is the Earth really the, the only little blue marble out there? Or are there many, many Earths, as some have theorized, as the Drake equation would tell us, and as you know, sci-fi movies and directors would have us believe? So what are exoplanets? At their, at their most basic, exoplanets are just planets that are not part of our solar system. There really isn't any magic to them. They're just round chunks of rock floating, orbiting other stars beyond our solar system. There is a more specific definition, and that is that it's a planet that orbits a star other than our sun. Now, I'll come to that point in a, in a, in a few moments, but it's, a, it's an interesting refined point that an exoplanet is generally something that is orbiting uh, another star. It's seen to be something that's part of a system, whether it's just the planet and the star, or a planet, uh, or, or the star and multiple planets. Exoplanets are typically regarded as being part of another solar system. 
And this would seem to exclude the possibility, or the definition would seem to exclude planets orbiting other non-stellar bodies or non-star bodies, such as black holes, as we have here. We have uh, that planet and massive black hole as photographed in the, uh, in, in the movie Interstellar. And that, was, uh, that of course, involved uh, a planet orbiting uh, a black hole or a couple of planets orbiting a black hole and uh, the effects thereon. With respect to the history of exoplanets, the idea of exoplanets or the possibility of exoplanets has been speculated, philosophized, and studied for centuries. An Italian astronomer by the name of Giordano Bruno in the 16th century speculated of planets uh, orbiting around other stars. And Isaac Newton even mentioned the possibility in his great work, The Principia Mathematica. Just, uh, I'll just get you a quote, I'll just get you a couple of quotes here. G uh, Giordano Bruno said in 1584, this space we declare to be infinite. In it are an infinity of worlds of the same kind as our own. And Isaac Newton, writing, and if the fixed stars are the centers of similar systems, they will all be constructed according to a similar design and subject to the dominion of one. Now, I'm not clear what he meant by the dominion of one. I'm, I think he means the, the dominion of a single star, that, uh, a single body that controls the orbits of, the, uh, of its planets. But, uh, and of course, we now know that most planetary, sorry, most star systems are binary at least. But his idea was that, you know, perhaps the Earth isn't that special in that sense. There may, there will probably be other planets out there. Of course, 400 years ago, five, 500 years ago, no way to detect that. Uh, the, actual, the actual searches uh, for exoplanets uh, scientifically began fairly recently, and this was due to technological limitations that were eventually overcome as our technology increased. So starting in the late uh, 80s, uh, scientists and astronomers began searching for uh, exoplanets using a variety of methods, which I will uh, mention uh, f further down. The first possible detection was in 1989, and the first confirmation was, uh, was in 1992 around a pulsar, a PSR B1257 plus 12. And this is an artist's depiction of what that system might look like. So you have the pulsar here and uh, the, the planet here, the theorized planet here, and there's another theorized uh, planet there. And I, th I think there's a third one over here. But again, purely speculative. The next question is how are exoplanets detected? Uh, detected? And there are a variety of methods. Uh, the classic one, perhaps the most, and the one most familiar to uh, uh, sort of from the literature, even general literature, is uh, transit photometry, which is in other words, the st as the planet passes in front of the star, its parent star, the star's light dims or appears to dim. And what we have here is a graphic representation of uh, the star's uh, luminosity. So what we have, uh, so this would be uh, time across the uh, x-axis and uh, luminosity across the y. And uh, so the star is putting out a certain amount of light, and then all of a sudden you see a dip. And then the dip ends and it comes back up. And that's a classic signature of a, uh, of a possible exoplanet. Now, of course, this is not unique to exoplanets. Other uh, interstellar phenomenon can cause this. Uh, but this is one of the telltales. This is one of the most important uh, signs. There's also... Uh, one, another method is gravitational microlensing. As, uh, as you may remember from physics, when a, gravi when a body with gravity, mass, passes in front of another body and there's light, the light will be bent around uh, the object uh, by its gravity. And uh, they can use this to detect, uh, sorry, scientists can use this to detect a dark body passing in front of a, uh, of a, of a background object. There's also uh, another classic is astrometry, which is measuring the disturbance of a star caused by the orbiter's gravity. So as, uh, as, as Newton uh, 
pointed out, you know, every, everything has gravity. And, uh, and so everything with mass acts on everything else. So a, uh, a two-body system isn't just one thing rotating around another. Both things are rotating around each other. So the Earth and the Moon rotate around a uh, rotate around each other. Uh, there's a spot below the Earth's surface where, which is the the center point of that gravitational dance, you can call it. Uh, and so what uh, scientists do is they can detect perturbations in, in a star's uh, orbit or in its movements, and uh, that's a po that indicates a possible uh, exoplanet. And finally, there's direct imaging. It's very hard to do because <laughs> the object has to be pretty close and uh, has to be reflective enough to reflect the light of its parent star, but it can be done and has been done. All told, there are about a dozen different methods, uh, and these are just four of them. Uh, and some of the instruments that are currently being used are HARPS and uh, Kepler, which is a uh, satellite to detect, uh, which is now, I think, I believe dedicated to detecting exoplanets. The methods, uh, have uh, the methods that we've used and as our technology has increased, we have been able to discover more and more exoplanets every year. So starting uh, back in the late 80s, you can see very few discoveries, slowly, 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 and then whoosh, as our, as our technology and as, and as our understanding of exoplanets and systems has increased, we now, we now know what to look for. Interestingly enough, the most, uh, the, the, lately, the best, uh, the best method for discovering uh, exoplanets has been the transiting feature. So again, a uh, planet moves in front of a star, dims the light, and that seems to have uh, generated the, the vast majority of, uh, of, um, of discoveries re recently. And to show you how, how far along this has come, on the 1st of January, 1988, we knew of no exoplanets. And as of the 1st of September this year, there are 3,518 confirmed exoplanets. Exoplanets are divided into various types. And there, there, there are ways to divide uh, planets, you know, rocky, gaseous giant, uh, warm, hot. Uh, there are many ways. Uh, this, is a, this is a handy little graph that, um, that divides it by uh, size. And uh, size and type. And so you have gas giants over here and Jovian, the, the Jovians are the, are the big ones. These, these are the ones that are the size of Jupiter or greater. And there's a type called the super Jupiter, which are uh, many times, a planet's gaseous giants, many times the size of, of uh, Jupiter. And as you can see, the vast majority of, of uh, detected and confirmed exoplanets are gaseous giants, the big ones. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're more common, but indications are they probably are. But uh, it's also because they're the ones that, with the greatest mass, will exert the, uh, the greatest uh, perturbance on their parent star, and so they're the easiest to detect. As you can see, very, very few in, uh, in, the, um, in the habitable zone, which is this middle bit here, although we have detected 10, uh, at least when this graph was made, uh, 10 what are called warm super terrans. In other words, uh, planets that are closer to uh, their star than the Earth, uh, but, and are more massive, but may still be conducive to uh, human life, or life in general. So getting on to uh, Proxima b. This is an artist's conception of Proxima b. This is the one that's been causing all the bother uh, recently. So it was first detected in August 2016, and as uh, Al pointed out, it orbits it, it's, its orbit of its parent star is very quick, 11.186 days, and it's only 0 0.39 AU from uh, Proxima b. And this uh, makes it, uh, it would be uh, two and a half times closer to, the, to its star than we are to the sun. And because of this, it receives approximately, we, again, we're speculating here, approximately 400 times the uh, the amount of radiation that uh, the Earth receives. And since Proxima Centauri, uh, the star, is so dim, uh, it, uh, we, it's theorized so far that 
the, the, the planet would never get brighter than about twilight on Earth. I've uh, read some, uh, a recent updated, uh, updated uh, speculation on, on Proxima b, and uh, the, the current thinking is that its surface temperature is on average about minus 40 degrees Celsius. So not great, not inhospitable though, I mean, we're from Canada, we deal with minus 40 every so often. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I'll be. Just, I'll, I might as well move there. It's it's laughing. It's laughing. It's warmer. It's warmer. True. So um, so there's still a lot uh, that we don't know. But the search continues, and as our instruments become greater and uh, more refined, and as our understanding increases, we'll uh, be able to detect uh, more and more exoplanets. We'll be able to find, you know, who knows what what solar systems we'll find out there. The uh, sort of, of great, you know, we'll find supergiants that, uh, that come in right close to their, uh, to, their, to their parent star, whether we'll find you know, Earth-like planets, we don't know. Although the statistic is that um, given the distribution of planets and uh, a few other uh, educated, uh, some more educated guesswork, there are between 11 to 40 billion habitable Earth-sized planets in the entire Milky Way. So uh, again, this, this number will be refined as, uh, as our understanding is refined. But uh, if, if, if the human drive to explore continues, and I don't see any reason why it'll stop, this will be the next uh, frontier. And it'll be the discoveries that will drive uh, human, uh, human exploration further and further into space and uh, take us, well, we don't know where. Proxima B might be just the first stop, you never know. And who knows, we might be standing one day looking out at this, this kind of nice scene and it might not even seem that alien to us anymore. All right, thank you. All right, I have a, I'll, I'll take one or two questions, but again, uh, my knowledge is limited. Yes, at the, at the back there. It's a very good question. Um, the, the, the list that I had didn't break it down any further, but, uh, but a lot of... I did not, I do not have a number. Again, a lot of the confirmations will... The statistic I was reading was confirmed, so a lot of the, um, so a lot of the confirmations will come from professional uh, sites because, uh, because the, um, of course, the technology is, is only available to, pe to, to much, much larger budgets. However, again, as we've seen, as I said when I first uh, came, just, uh, just a second, uh, when, I, uh, when I started as meeting chair, the technology that has become available to amateurs since I started in the club is, has, has, is incredible. So uh, who knows what, we'll be see, what amateurs will be able to do in 10, 15 years. Sorry, Gordon, you had a question. Wow, so 8 in scope, you only, don't even need uh, that much equipment. Yes, Mike. I was going to say that a lot of the uh, amateur detections were done using Kepler, but the data is accessible by anyone, and there's actually a cool little program you can go help um, pick out planets, and then if they have enough people to agree that that's a planet, if you're looking at the, the lines, yeah. uh, then they see if they can confirm it professionally. But a lot of the amateur ones that were detected are using the Kepler data. Oh, I see. So they, it's kind of like um, sharing the uh, sharing it's, the workload. It's crowdsourced. Crowdsourced, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's like a SETI at home kind of thing. But mm. it's SETI at home, but more chance of success. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions? Uh, no? Okay. Well, then we'll thank you very much. We'll move on. And uh, Bob Olson and his giant newt. Turn down the house lights, please. Well, how do you do? Uh, this started five years ago at uh, Starfest. A guy, I was at the swap table, and uh, a guy called Bob Anderson had a uh, 
12 and a half inch uh, quartz mirror made by Norman Fulham, a Canadian, uh, Canadian mirror grinder of, of fairly high reputation. And he had a price of $500 on it. I had always wanted to make a, uh, an imaging Newtonian, and uh, this mirror would be perfect for it. I had already decided on a 12-inch telescope. And uh, the $500 seemed to be reasonable. Uh, Norman, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Bob told me that it, was a f it cost him $1,500 to buy it from Normand. So um, I said, I need permission to spend $500. Uh, I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, Unlike most of the males in this audience, uh, I am not the financial boss of my family. And my wife was uh, at Starfest with me. And I asked Bob if he would just hold the mirror for five minutes, I'll just run up and ask my wife if I could. So I, he said, tell her it's only $300. <laughs> I thought to myself, that's a great way to start off, you know, lie to my wife. <laughs> that's not turned out really good in the past. Uh, so anyway, I headed up to see Ginny and, and uh, told her I'd like to buy this $500 mirror, and her answer was no, which I probably should have expected. Um, and she threw in my face all the other unfinished projects that I had, uh, which I thought was unfair tactics. Uh, anyway, I pleaded, and uh, she said yes. I may have actually cried a bit. I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> So she said, yeah, go ahead. And so I went down with uh, the $500 to, to Bob, and uh, Bob said, uh, uh, 300 bucks. So he wasn't asking me to lie to my wife. He was giving me a better deal. And uh, you know, I've had a lot of bargaining experience, uh, advice from uh, Richard Harding, and he's never mentioned being pathetic as one of the strategies to use. <laughs> anyway, so there I am now. I had the mirror. And you'll notice this was five years ago. So my wife's prediction about projects is probably pretty good. Um, now, I talked to Norman about this, uh, this, this uh, mirror later, and uh, he said that he remembered selling it to Bob, and he said it was one of the best mirrors he ever made. Uh, it'll, talking to a mirror maker about a mirror is sort of like talking to a used car salesman, but it made me feel better. Um, now, why did I make, finally make a telescope out of this thing? Uh, it's because I got a better, I got a bigger chip for my CCD, uh, my CCD camera. Um, so I got a different camera. And you can see that uh, the, new, the new one has, is about twice the dimensions of the old one. It sucks in about four times as much sky as my old one. And I, I actually needed better optics to run this. So I now had a kind of a, a reason to do this. By the way, this image is from Starry Night, it's not mine. So how do, you, how do you make a telescope? Well, the first thing is you have to have a design. And so there's this program called NUT, okay, that uh, telescope design project and uh, program. And uh, the copy I had, I think, was written by the programmer that came across with uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, and it was, uh, it was pathetic. Uh, you know, data entry is with a chisel and a tablet. Uh, I could not figure out how to use it. So I, f I actually gave uh, Tilla Danko a call and he gave me a few hints on how to run the program. Also, he's an expert on Newtonians. He gave me some advice on that, too. I think the first thing about this thing is, is I, you can see how far away the imaging plane is. It's, you know, it's, is this thing here actually work? Yeah. Way up there is where my film is going to be, my, my CCD. It's a long way, an eyepiece, you know, the film might be in here somewhere. Um, so you need a bigger mirror, a bigger secondary mirror here to, to get it to work. And uh, it turned out that my secondary mirror calculated out at four inches. So, you know, a third of the diameter of the telescope is taken, is blocked by the secondary mirror. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, uh, they're hard to come by. They're hard to find ones that big that are in good quality. All right. Now, the next thing is, how do you hold the mirror? And so on uh, Astromart, I bought a, uh, an old uh, Novak uh, nine-point uh, mirror mount. And they're kind of interesting. The mirror balances on these triangles, which are balancing on that center point there. And they work really well. Um, it, the Novak didn't have a program called PLOP to calculate this, so I had to actually move them a little bit to make it uh, more, uh, give me a less distortion in my mirror face. The problem is these cork pads on the outside edges, they were grabbing my, my mirror. And so when I tipped my telescope all over the place, like when I'm imaging, it would actually 
holds my mirror off of those those triangles, and uh, and then it was no it was no longer pointing in the same part of the sky, so I ended up gluing them with using a silicon uh, adhesive to the uh, to those triangles. If you do that, you actually change the how well it works. It works worse, but. It doesn't fall out of my telescope this way either. And this is the program called PLOP, which was written about the same time Newt was. Uh, but it gives you some, it tells you the, uh, all the characteristics that you need to know, including the dimensions of your mirror cell and the distortions you'd expect. And I was willing to live with the distortions that I was adding by gluing my, my, my mirror on. Now, I uh, got the rings and tube from a guy called Joe Nass DC at parallax rings. And that brings me to a question here, now, a thing about the, uh, a big decision about what I was gonna build, my, how I'm gonna build my telescope. What material should I use for my, my, my tube? And the choices really boil down to aluminum or, or uh, carbon fiber. And aluminum is cheaper and stiffer and conducts heat quickly away so that uh, the mirror cools off fast. It's easier to work with, but the problem with it is it expands and contracts a lot. With, with changes in temperature. And when you're imaging, that matters. I mean, your, your, your picture will start off in focus and end out, out of focus. So that was a big, a big uh, uh, disadvantage. Carbon fiber, on the other hand, is lighter. It's temperature stable. You almost don't have to refocus if you get the right kind. And it looks cool, right? That really critical. Uh, but it's very expensive, costs about four times as much as an aluminum tube. It's hard to work with. I don't really, as a matter of fact, I don't, I don't even know how to work with carbon fiber. Uh, I feel quite comfortable drilling a hole in aluminum, but carbon fiber acts weird. Um, it's stiffer. Uh, to make it stiffer, they put a, a, a core between two layers of carbon fiber, so you kind of get a sandwich. And then it's a nightmare to bolt things to it because you crush that inner core. If it doesn't have the inner core, uh, it's a little bit too flexible. So it's a kind of a lose-lose thing there. Anyway, I chose aluminum, and uh, Ginny chose the color. All right. Uh, these are the spiders that I used uh, that holds the secondary mirror. I got those from Astro Systems. Uh, this is the secondary holder, which I also got from Astro Systems. And my, the way this works is you undo those two screws and sort of fold back this aluminum tin can. And then in here, you put your secondary mirror. And so they need to know exactly how big it is to make this aluminum can. And um, then you stuff the back in here with cotton batten. And so the you sort of stuff it in, and then you put your mirror in, and the cotton batten wants to force the mirror out. And that's how you hold your mirror in there. It was the screwiest system I ever saw. And uh, I guess it works pretty good. Um, to adjust the, once you've got it installed, these knobs, are how you adjust the angle of the secondary. And this is what holds it on. And by making the bolt longer and shorter, you can change the pos vertical position of the, uh, where this is going to point. So it's a good system. Works really well. OK. This is the whole thing all put together again. And you'll notice that there's uh, some wires leading out of it. There's a heater in there to keep my secondary from doing uh, in a, a sort of hot days. Um, the secondary, the four-inch secondary came from a company called uh, Protostar. Now, um, you'll notice there are no baffles in this scope. Uh, so light hitting the side of the telescope bounces all over the place. Uh, you can put uh, a sort of felt inside of it, uh, a flocking, and that will stop it too. I just painted it black. Eventually, I'm going to put in uh, baffles or flocking. I haven't decided which. I couldn't think of how to attach the baffles. I can make them. I don't know how, how do you attach them to the inside of an aluminum tube without sort of drilling holes in your tube. All right. Now, I got this uh, JMI focuser from Peter Cerevolo uh, via Doug, uh, John Douglas. Uh, he had it at a swap table. And um, the only thing I did to it really was I changed the gearing in here and put a, a RoboFocuser motor on it so that I could do automated runs. Uh, you will notice. Uh, my camera, my new camera, my filter wheel. And in here, there is a, uh, a coma corrector. It's a, a lens that uh, allows Newtonians to be used for imaging. It's a, it's a, it's a corrector uh, set of lenses. And you'll notice that even after that, I only have about an inch of free play here. So the telescope was just, you know, the, 
it was designed pretty well. But this is not exactly what you'd call a low profile type system. I mean, it's sticking out a mile. Um, so, I, you know, if you're putting an eyepiece on this, your eyepiece would have to be way back here somewhere. So it would be quite a challenge to use this thing visually. Um, another, intro, another sort of problem I had was, you see this curved base here? Well, my tube is 16 inches in diameter, so how do you put a curved base on a big piece of flat, uh, big uh, block of aluminum? And uh, I heard all kinds of ideas on how to do this, uh, most of them, like, dangerous. Uh, the one I chose was I just put it on my, my vertical mill and started chewing out little chunks at a time. And uh, with trial and error, I uh, eventually got it down. I had a round-nosed end mill that I used for most of the work. But it took a, a job that would take a CNC shop about two minutes. It took me about two days. And now, what kind of problems do I, am I having with this scope? Well, the first thing is, uh, these are, this, is the, this is my 9-inch scope that I was using before, and this is my new 12. I was stunned by the difference in size. You know, 9 inches, 12 inches, doesn't sound like that much. Uh, but with this one here has got a folded path. You know, the light comes in the front, hit, uh, hits the mirror here, bounces up there, and bounces, and it comes all, it's all nice in a straight line. This one here is only, this goes down and comes back. It's a big, long, linear thing, bigger diameter, too. When I first got this tube, I was expecting a tube that would be kind of small. It looked like a garbage can. Uh, it was monstrous. So I can no longer lift this thing onto the scope, onto the mount myself. I need, I need help. Uh, now, I need, because it weighs so much, I need twice as many weights. And it's worse than that. I had to extend the bar. So I milled this aluminum bar and uh, threaded it on. Uh, I, it's thread, when I'm running it, it's tight. <laughs> it's no gap. And uh, that gets my weights out a little bit further, allows me to, uh, to balance the scope. And the scope, the mount is an Astrophysics 900 mount. I must be getting close to the limit of it, but it's handling it no trouble at all. It does not care at all that, the way, that, that I can't lift the, the telescope. Um, my telescope is on wheels. It's in my observatory, and I roll it out when I want to observe. And so these pins are dropped down in those holes, which are in the concrete pad that I observe on. And they run on these wheels. And I put them up and down by stepping on that sort of cam. And the telescope was so heavy, it bent the metal. So that had to be uh, uh, changed. So I, I manufactured a, a more robust mount, and this time, I don't have to step on it anymore. I put a motor on it. <laughs> the, the only problem I have is the motor runs a little too fast, and so I, had to, I have to be careful with the switch. Otherwise, I run my screw out of, out of the end there. Now, when I got the telescope, for some reason or another, Bob had put a piece of scotch tape on the, on the mirror. So right here, a little bit of the coating was lifted off. And that makes absolutely no difference, you know, uh, to the optics of the mirror. But when I took flats, that, that piece of glass that was there by, instead of the mirror showed up in my flats. Uh, it was actually reflecting stuff back from the back of the mirror. And uh, so I, I, I handled it in a true uh, Roadrunner uh, uh, fashion. Uh, I, took a magic marker and smeared magic marker all over it. <laughs> so it doesn't reflect anywhere. Solved the problem. But clearly, I'm, gonna re I'm going to uh, uh, recoat my mirror sometime. Normand coats mirrors. I'll probably use him. Another sort of weird problem was when this thing parks after a run at night, my telrad was facing, the sun was coming in right in through the top. And it fried my reticle. And I mean, I mean, it just curled it up like somebody put a match to it. I didn't even know there was it could that could happen. And so I, uh, I, I actually uh, used my laser printer and a piece of plastic, and I printed a new radical, and then I uh, covered it with a piece of tin. Very attractive looking. Um, the back of the mirror has these holes, and uh, therefore, they're for fans, which will eventually be put in there. I believe tube currents are a problem with this scope. Um, it gets pretty warm, and it's uh, pretty big. 
uh, I think that uh, you know the big long optical path all the way through the tube is a problem, and so I will put fans in there. We'll see if that makes a difference. Uh, once the sun, you know, once it cools off, it's fine. But for the first little while, imaging uh, is is kind of a challenge. Uh, this is my guide scope, by the way. Uh, there's another. That's my old camera, and uh, the light comes down through there. It's picked up by a chip in that camera, and then that chip runs this mount. So the uh, mount tracks, and it, I can quite easily track to within ha a tenth of a pixel. And I think I've got six micron pixels, so it's tracking to uh, a, a tenth of one of six microns. Now, did it improve my imaging? Well, sure, it's faster. You know, this is an F4 instead of an F6 point something, so I can get the image done about half the time. Uh, it's better optics, but you know what? Where I'm sitting, uh, the, the air boils a bit. Uh, I often have the uh, I often have the jet stream right over my head, and uh, so that makes more trouble than a bad optics. Though the optics in this scope are really good. When the seeing is good, this, I get I get great sharp images. Um, it's a very impressive scope. You know, I'm standing beside this big thing dwarfs me, and the neighbors all think it's awesome. Uh, actually, my neighbors one time accused me of using it to spy on them. <laughs> and, you know, I can't, see any, I can't see anybody's house where I am. So I told them that uh, uh, if I had more attractive neighbors, it would be more of a problem. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's a home-built scope. It's sort of fun. Home-built's pretty stupid. Eh? It's, it's a home-assembled scope. And uh, Ginny has finally forgiven me for getting all this junk, which is important. <laughs> all right. Uh, just to finish off with one little thing here. I live right here. You can see I've got this big forest right in my, this is where I, I image in this direction. So I have great, uh, great uh, dark skies where I'm imaging. Can you point out where you're, where you're living at? I live right here. And if I zoom in on my, where I live, um, this is my, my house and my fire pit, which uh, Jenny always wants to run when I'm going to image. And this is where I observe from. And that's my new <laughs> Google Earth. Picked up my scope. <laughs> now, uh, I guess the only thing I can say about that is, you know those guys who have conspiracy theories? Eh, it could be something to it, you know? You be careful what you do in your backyard. OK, thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you. So if anyone has any questions, uh, we'll wait. Uh, we'll, because it's uh, nearly 9.20, we'll just, uh, you can just uh, uh, find on him at the, after, the, uh, after the break. Sorry, yes, after the, after the end of the meeting. All right, so we'll get on to the observation reports. So if we could have Paul Cloninger, Taras Rabatsky, Oscar Echeverry, and Bob Olson down, please. And we'll start at the top of the list with Paul. Well, hi, everybody. Hope you've had a good summer. Uh, we've certainly had some uh, nice skies this summer, uh, so I hope you've had a chance to get out, do a lot of observing. And for those of you that are doing imaging, uh, likewise. Certainly has been my, my uh, experience this summer. I've uh, had a chance to go to a number of uh, very cool places uh, and, uh, and have been blessed with some very nice skies. So uh, all that being said, I haven't had a chance to process a lot, but I thought I'd give you just a bit of a sampler of of some of the things that, uh, that uh, I've done in the last couple of months and, and the reasons why I've missed the last couple of meetings. So um, if we can have the first one. Oh, um, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that was, uh, I wasn't. <laughs> can we turn down the house lights, please? <laughs> nice one, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, before I get blinded. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to, uh, to uh, win uh, a, a, um, at the uh, Starfest uh, imaging contest uh, this summer, where I was uh, actually just about four weeks ago. And uh, this uh, particular shot uh, 
Eric and Tiris, you probably recognize this because you were with me when I took it. This was up at Teeple Hill last November there, and I managed to catch a nice bright Perseid meteor as I was doing a time lapse of the uh, Milky Way setting. And uh, I guess the uh, folks at Starfest liked it too, and they, uh, they awarded me first place on, uh, on, uh, on that image in the uh, uh, astronomical uh, night, night landscape uh, uh, division. So I was uh, kind of happy with that. Um, next one, please. Uh, they also, much to my surprise, uh, gave me second place <laughs> in the same division, so thank you. So that was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a, a neat thing to happen. Uh, but uh, yeah, the first one was uh, from Teeple Hill. This is just from uh, down the street from my place. Uh, this was an aurora that happened uh, last October, and uh, it was a, it was quite nice uh, photographically. It wasn't all that impressive uh, visually. You could see certainly some of the rays in that, but the color was a little bit on the threshold. But the, certainly the camera picked it up nice. And that I think I've shown you that uh, that time lapse. The aurora auroral rays just danced for a good part of the evening as they marched across the sky, and new ones came in to take their place. So. That was my uh, uh, aurora from my, from my place. All right, next one. Uh, Starfest itself, uh, we, had, uh, we were blessed with very nice weather there. Uh, we had, uh, I was, personally, I was there for four nights. Uh, we had four nights of usable skies. Uh, some of the nights were better than others. Uh, this was uh, one of the first, uh, I think, one of the first evenings that we were there. And uh, just as uh, the, the uh, twilight was setting in there, a very slender crescent moon, just a couple of degrees above the horizon. Uh, and so you can see it was, uh, uh, it was pretty clear that night, just a little bit of thin cloud uh, down, down close to the ground. Um, next one. And as, as night set, uh, that's a, just, a, just a wide angle view from uh, our campsite at Starfest there. Uh, as I said, we did have some pretty nice skies there. I managed to catch one of the Perseid meteors up at the, uh, the top of the frame there. And, uh, and uh, as, uh, as twilight ended and we got into some, some very dark sky there, uh, um, very, very pleasing there. It, uh, you can certainly see some of the light glow down closer to the horizon from places like you know, Kitchener, and over off to the light, uh, over over off to the uh, left hand side, uh, some residual glow from Toronto there as well. But the skies generally uh, up at the zenith and and to the north uh, and and uh, and west are, are pretty reasonable there. So yeah, we we were lucky. We were blessed with uh, no rain because it's really nice to pack up your equipment and it's dry. Yeah, that's that's a real treat. So that was Starfest. I've, I've got some others that I'm processing there uh, that, that that I will show you as as the months go on. So uh, the, this year, uh, Starfest was about a week before the peak of the Perseids. Uh, so after we came back, because we didn't have enough uh, uh, imaging under our belt, uh, Eric LeMay and I were, were looking at the night of the Perseid peak, and we were uh, thinking, OK, so most of eastern Ontario is just basking in clouds. And, uh, but we did see a potential for a sucker hole, and we thought, let's go chasing. So we, we uh, packed up our equipment and we wound up dri driving down to uh, Kaladar, the, uh, the observing uh, platform down about 10 kilometers south of, of Kaladar at the uh, dark sky site. And uh, we called it right. Uh, we were looking at our satellite images there and uh, managed to catch the sucker hole just as it was passing over top of us there. Uh, much to our surprise, because we got there late. Eric's always late, so sorry, Eric. But, uh, uh, much to our surprise, when we got there, just before we got there, I was saying to Eric, I, said, Gee, I wonder if there's going to be anybody out here because it's been cloudy most of the night and this sucker hole is just very, very transitory. Uh, we got to the platform and wouldn't you know it, there was, must have been 50 people there. <laughs> anyway, as it turned out, we, we, we didn't want to interrupt people with our, with our setting up equipment and things like that, so we wound up uh, just going a couple of kilometers uh, south uh, from the platform there found a nice little pull off uh, the side of the road there and set up our imaging gear there and we were lucky enough to, uh, to catch some, uh, a few nice Perseids like this. This one was one of the first shots that I took. I had just finished setting up my camera and it was just doing some longer exposures. You can see their trail. This is just camera on tripod stuff. And uh, the trees got lit up by a, a car coming down the highway, but just as one of the brighter Perseids that I saw during the night uh, was coming through. So I left it in neat effect though. Uh, so we did see a bunch of good ones there. We did have intermittent cloud, uh, but we had, uh, we had basically uh, uh, probably about, what, two, two three hours of, of reasonable sky arc, I would think. So uh, we managed to shoot a whole pile of images. That was one of mine, and uh, the other one that I got that I thought I'd share with you, I like the effect on, on, on this next one there. 
you can see the clouds just starting to move in. Uh, uh, if you follow the uh, the Perseids at all this year, uh, we did. There was an expected uh, bump in the in the numbers, um, and as it turned out, one of the bumps, uh, the primary enhancement to the Perseids this year, came about. Uh, I think it was around. Um, about 2,300 universal. So it was it was still quite light. It was around seven o'clock uh, in our part of the world. Uh, but there was a secondary uh, peak that occurred around uh, seven hours universal, putting it at around 3 p.m. Just at around the time the clouds were coming through for us, or 3 a.m. rather. Uh, so uh, yeah, within about five minutes, this scene was completely clouded over. But I think that was one of the ones from the peak because that was just around three o'clock there, and you can just see it buzzing the uh, the Pleiades there. So. So we, we lucked out with the, with the Perseid catch. And uh, next one, please. Uh, earlier earlier uh, in the summer, I uh, had the pleasure of spending some time camping on the shores of Lake Superior. Uh, this, not by coincidence, was, was timed with a, a moonless sky because uh, I was hoping to get into some very dark skies up in Superior. It's in the black up in the, on the Bortle scale there, so, so pretty impressive stuff. Had excellent weather up there and, uh, and some really interesting uh, um, uh, skies, uh, including this uh, sunset shot, which uh, to me looked kind of like a volcano coming off of that island. Uh, one of the old locals named the island, I think he was, said it was something like Marauder or Mordor, or so, I can't remember what it was, but anyway, it, it looked volcanic, but the clouds were, were fascinating. And then of course, in the night sky, I was just totally blown away. My last shot is uh, a shot from that's, that's where I was camping, and it was just like a, I, I couldn't pull myself away from it. This is a, just a stationary shot. Again, I was shooting a time lapse of the Milky Way moving across that sky and setting, but uh, just stunningly dark skies up there, and uh, no bugs, surprisingly. And uh, it was just uh, it was quite an experience to be under that dark a sky, uh, even, even though my place uh, where I live has, has some pretty decent skies. Uh, yeah, when you're in the black there, you. Uh, you, you, you know it, and, and it's amazing how, how much deeper you can see, even if the sky is only half a magnitude darker or something. So, a uh, very pleasurable experience, and I'll show you that time lapse when I've had a chance to put it together. That's it for today. Thank you. Taras, next. Great pictures, Paul, and congrats on winning the uh, first two prizes. Really impressive. Thanks, sir. No problem. I have a um, few pictures of uh, deep sky objects taken within the last two months. Um, actually, this was only three weeks ago at uh, Centennial Lake. This is uh, Helix Nebula. It's a pretty dim object. It's uh, uh, surprisingly not an exploded star yet, which is right here in the center. Its size Oops, slightly smaller than our uh, than our sun, but uh, the star is dying. It's shedding its uh, outer layers, and uh, uh, I guess there is some rotation involved or so. So it uh, spa spatially creates this helix shape, and um, st uh, the uh, star is so bright that it. Uh, radiates so much glow that it makes uh, all the gases around uh, uh, fluoresce. Uh, it's a combination of two shots, one taken with a regular camera, which responds for most of the colors, and I've added uh, a little bit of uh, uh, modified camera image uh, with the hydrogen alpha. And partially I use it for brightness as well, but uh, I'm happy more or less with the result. Um, Triffid Nebula, uh, or uh, M20, if I'm not mistaken. You know very well about it. It's actually quite interesting object. It's a combination of three types of um, um, objects or types of nebula. There is, um, um, uh, this is reflection nebula, this is um, emission nebula, and the dark lines, it's actually uh, clouds of dust uh, which are so thick that they cover the glow of, uh, again, hydrogen alpha 
in red. So what's interesting, I think, is that what uh, Tim was saying about uh, spectrography, that uh, this is mostly those red lines of uh, hydrogen which we see, although um, on his picture there were a few other colors, but I guess it, intensity also matters. So hydrogen alpha, the, the line which is the most brightest, is the red. That's why we, so we see lots of red color. Uh, Lagoon, again, it's an uh, image taken with uh, completely with a modified camera, so it's predominantly hydrogen alpha, uh, which glows brightly red. Um, it's also quite a complex, complex object. It contains uh, uh, stars, uh, star forming region with clumps of matter which ignite into the stars. There is a, a star cluster there and uh, hourglass nebula. Um, I'm pretty happy with the result as well. And uh, this is a great place, actually, just to go and be and do in, uh, observations and take photography or just enjoy uh, the scenery. It's a Centennial Lake. It's on the way to Matachawan, if I'm not mis Matachawan, Matawachan, uh, close from Griffith. Um, there is a small, well, pretty big lake, actually, but a small pit where you can park your car and uh, enjoy the view. There is an island in the middle, and, uh, oh, sorry, this is the island. And this is the road, and highway goes this way, this is bridge. Um, there is very few people living there, but there is still a little bit, little bit of light pollution, as you can see. But generally, the place is very dark. Uh, on a um, light pollution uh, uh, map, when you look at it, it's on a, this dark grayish scale. And I'm happy with the result, how Milky Way showed up. I also took this with a modified camera, so there is a little bit of uh, reddish glow here. There is, um, this is the end of uh, Sagittarius, like top part, uh, with uh, only a few stars uh, being shown from Sagittarius, because at that time, uh, this part of uh, Milky Way was moving down this way. Um, and there is a little bit of, uh, Aquarius somewhere there where I took that image of uh, uh, Helix Nebula. Thank you. Right, I think uh, Oscar, you're next. Okay, so this is, uh, this is an image I took of the Eagle Nebula. Um, so I took this one at Starfest, uh, despite battling some bugs with my equipment and a broken power supply. I think Paul bailed me out with his power supply at, uh, at Starfest there. Uh, so this is a composite image of um, uh, about an hour and a half worth of five minute exposures. Uh, so it's, a, it's an emission, hydrogen alpha emission nebula. Um, which was the point on this one? Uh, so one of the things that like really blows my mind about this object is so this is the uh, the famous pillars of creation there and uh, there's another pillar there but this this pillar here is nine and a half light years long so that's ninety trillion kilometers I think so uh, yeah that's that. Finally, uh, Bob, if you want to come back up and give us your give us your images. These were all taken with that scope you saw. Uh, this is M39. It's found in Cygnus. It's uh, 800 uh, light years away, and um, Messier listed this in his catalog as M M39 because it could, he didn't want it. To, he was, it was a list of things that aren't comets, and. I look at this and I say, you know, must have, he must have had a pathetic telescope to think this was going to be a comet. Attila one time told me this was his favorite globular. Uh, it's uh, uh, 33,000 uh, light years away, pretty far away. It may have a black hole in it. Um, and it has about 100,000 stars. It also has a planetary in it. Uh, one of these days I'm going to try and find that planetary, maybe with, by doing a little bit of uh, O3 imaging, but uh, I'd have no idea where it is in this image. Uh, this is the dumbbell. It's a planetary. It's got a white dwarf in the middle. It's about 1,300 light years away, and it blew up about 10,000 years ago. Uh, interestingly enough, 
all you have to do is measure how fast the edges are going and run it backwards. And you can figure out how long ago it happened. Um, the, the fact that the colors get split off a bit is uh, you hear various theories. My best guess is that it's is this this little thing in the middle is spinning, probably has a magnetic field, and throws off oxygen and and uh, hydrogen in different directions uh, from their from their f the magnetic fields and their charge. This is M seventy one. I don't know very much about M seventy one. It's a globular. It's uh, tw uh, 1,200, uh, 12,000 light years away, and it's really young. It's only nine billion years old. Uh, if that's young, what on earth are the old ones? <laughs> you know? And the Omega Nebula, I normally think of this as the swan. It's uh, about 5,000 light years away, and it's massive and bright. Actually, the most massive and bright star forming region in our galaxy, they say. So this is all just forming, uh, forming um, uh, stars. And uh, one of the articles I read about it said that this is just like the uh, Orion Nebula, except it's an edge-on view rather than a, a face-on view. OK, thank you. Thank you very much to our contributors. Lovely images. All right, so we've uh, reached more or less the end, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, so uh, star parties, yes, um, yes? Okay. Are, we, are we good, Eric? Yeah. We're good. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, all right, so we have, uh, so we have uh, star parties, as, uh, as I explained to uh, someone who asked a question earlier uh, in the, during the break, uh, we have them about once a month from April to October. And they're always at the uh, public library in CARP, which happens to be the parking lot of the Diefenbunker. So uh, there's the Diefenbunker there, there's the library, and this is where we do the observing. Good site, very good site, and easy to get to. And get this. Ah, four in a row. Four in a row we've done. So uh, going for the uh, trying to trying to keep batting a thousand. Uh, the next the next uh, day will is scheduled to be the twenty third of uh, this month with these rain dates. Now I know that the twenty fourth is the rain date for the star BQ. So this date may have to be either changed or we may just use the thirtieth and first as our rain dates. But hopefully the twenty third will be a nice clear day and we can get five. You know, five primary dates in a row. I don't think that's ever happened before. I'm not even sure four, four primary dates in a row have ever happened before. That's really good. Estelle's pick of the month is uh, this book called The Stars by H.A. Ray. Again, if you're a member of the Ottawa Center, you can uh, take out a loan of a book uh, from our library. Now we come to my weird but true segment. I'll, uh, I'll be brief. I think many of you will recognize what these are. You have Vesta, Lutetia, Matilda, Ida, and Dactyl, Eros, Gaspra, Steins, Itakawa. What are these? Asteroids. asteroids. All right. So there are millions of asteroids in the asteroid belt alone, and millions more similar objects in other areas, such as the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, far beyond our, um, uh, far beyond the orbit of Pluto. There are about 1.1 to 1.9 million asteroids, uh, this is just in the, uh, in the asteroid belt, with a diameter greater than one kilometer. So these are considered uh, fairly large asteroids. The Chicxulub impactor was, uh, was at least 10 kilometers in diameter, killed off the dinosaurs, and left a crater at least 100, 180 kilometers across. Now I say, uh, now I know there's debate as whether it was a comet, whether it was an asteroid, doesn't really matter, it hit the Earth and killed a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> But um, it's, it, was, it was big. It was very big. Uh, 10 kilometers higher, uh, bigger than Everest is high. Uh, and when I say 180 kilometers, at least 180 kilometers across, there is some evidence uh, that the ring that we see with the cenotes and everything, which is 180 kilometers in diameter, may only be the inner ring. And there may be a larger outer ring, 300 kilometers, uh, 300, 300 kilometers in diameter. Needless to say, whatever caused the Chicxulub impact was massive 
it, it, it tore a chunk out of the planet. Uh, and there are 14,464 known asteroids that cross the Earth's path uh, that are, and about 1,000 are greater than one kilometer in diameter. And these are the ones uh, that could cause devastation on a global scale if uh, they hit us with, at a given speed. So what's, uh, what are we to do? I mean, we've, we, I mean, we have those awful movies like Armageddon and Deep Impact, and I think there was an earlier one in the 70s called Asteroid. What, what do we do? Well, NASA's on it. NASA has a section dedicated to saving the world. This is, it's called the Planetary Defense Coordina Coordination Office. This is 100% true. You can actually, you can visit it, you can visit their website. It was launched in January 2016, and its mission includes tracking near-Earth objects, NEOs, and planning their deflection. Uh, so if there's an asteroid coming, these are the people who are going to think of a way to try to save us all. And it doesn't even get, it, it gets even weirder. It gets even weirder. NASA is developing a, a mission to go to an asteroid, blow off a chunk of it, and put it in orbit around the moon for astronauts to study at, at a later date. And the, the, uh, the tentative start date for this mission is 2020, so it's coming up. And you know, just saying it, there's no way anything could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> this, is, this is just the greatest idea anyone has ever had. Let's take something that travels at the speed of a bullet Faster than, faster than a bullet goes from a thing that created Chick's Lube, went from the, earth to the, from the moon to the earth in two seconds, has all that kinetic energy. Let's bring it purposefully as close as we possibly can and see what we can do with it. You know, you got, you got to wonder sometimes, but hey, you know, these are the people with PhDs and alphabets after their names, so maybe they know something I don't. It could go from the moon to the earth in two seconds, Roman. The, that's what... That's the speed of light. Oh, sorry, two, oh, two minutes. You're right. Thank you. Two minutes. Well, it could have gone in two seconds if it was going at the speed of light. We wouldn't be here. <laughs> well, it depends on the size. Well, anyway. You're right. So, so two minutes. It went through the Earth's atmosphere in two seconds. Yeah, you're right. I apologize. Two minutes. Still, two minutes. I mean, that's still pretty fast. That's still pretty fast. So I'm sorry. It's 1 60th the speed of light. It's still pretty fast. Um, and so, like I said, this is, this is an actual mission that they're planning or and, uh, and so, you know, keep, stay tuned because, you know, either this will be the greatest, one of the greatest feats in humanity or we'll all be dead. So, no biggie, no pressure. All right, so now that we've reached the end, um, uh, membership, uh, I've fielded a few questions about membership. These are the costs of membership down here. $45 if you're under 21 years old or under 25 but a student. Uh, family membership is $70 and a regular membership is $75. For that, you get access to the Ted Bean Loan Library of Telescopes, where you pay $10 and you can take a telescope out for a month. Uh, you also have access to the Stan Mott Library, where you can loan out a book on astronomy. And you also have access to the site, but not the buildings of the Fred Lossing Observatory. And these are some of the benefits of membership. You get these publications. Uh, I believe they're all electronic now, or at least available electronically. These are some of our uh, more important members or uh, members that hold positions. Our meetings are webcast uh, at this address, and you get them live, and then you can download them later if you wish, and they're archived. Uh, last month, we were up to date, so I expect we'll, we'll be we'll pretty much up to date by now as well. So tonight's audience was 102. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, and thank you to our host, uh, the Canadian Aviation and uh, Space Museum. I'll just remind you uh, when you leave that the museum is closed, so please just stay kind of in the, in the front area. Um, of course, you can use the toilet, but, uh, but please don't go wandering into the exhibits. After a meeting meeting is at Grace O'Malley's. Head down the Aviation Parkway, take a right on Ogilvy Road, and you'll be there within 200 meters. Next meeting, important, Friday, 7.30 PM, the 14th of October. This is again, we're offset because of the of uh, holidays. So we have um, uh, Thanksgiving, and so we're doing it on the second Friday of October. So uh, thank you very much for coming. To those who joined us online, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, and I hope to see you all in October. Uh, have a, a good month, clear skies. <laughs>